We're here live on May 24th, 2014 with a good friend of mine, PGA professional, Ted County. How you doing today, Ted? Hey, Lorenzo. I'm doing good, man. It's been, uh, been a while since I've seen you, and it's good to see you. Uh, I've been uh, playing this game for something like 62 years now, man. Wow. So, so I love it. And I want to play it another 62. I wish I had that kind of life ahead of me. I would love to play it another 62 years. Well, I've enjoyed it. Well, Ted, uh, we've been trying to get together for quite a while to, to get some of this out to the audience so people out in the country or across the world can kind of see uh, the, the time you put in the game and, and, the, and the joy you brought to so many thousands of golfers that you touch uh, with lessons, encouragement, and all those different things. Uh, uh, today we're going to just go ahead and let you tell your story and uh, so everyone can get an opportunity to see what you've done in golf. Well, yeah. Uh, Lorenzo, I started at, in the game of golf caddying at a country club, uh, Prince George's Country Club. It used to be called Beaver Dam Country Club. Uh, and I started by following my uncle one summer to the golf course. I was about 11 to 12 years old at the time. And he used to go there to caddy. He was something like 17, 16, 17 years old at the time. And once I followed him there uh, and, uh, and spent a day at the golf course, after that, man, he didn't have to show me the way. I lived in a little town in the country uh, called Glen Arden, Maryland. And from Prince George's Country Club, which was in Kentland, it's about maybe a little over a mile. And so it was an easy little hike for me. And once I learned how to go there, I started going there every day during the summer. And I would go there, and very seldom I would get a bag initially when I first started. But after a while, I, I, after shagging balls for a while while the pro there was teaching, I used to sit down uh, with the pro, and he would say, uh, he would call me and say, come on, let's go, I want you to shag some balls, so I got a lesson. And I would get there, and he said, you don't even have to go out there because this is a, a brand new student. Uh, they probably won't get hit by one or two balls. And, and I would sit there with, that, with him and watch him teach, and, and he was really, really good at, at imitating a golf swing, <clears throat> the person's swing. So I kind of put, add that a little bit to my way of teaching, along with uh, learning quite a bit, I guess, from, from watching him. Didn't think that, that at that time that I would ever be a golf pro teaching the game of golf. But I, I learned how to, to play. I used to caddy quite a bit during those days. Uh, and then it reached the point where I had gotten a little bigger. I was a little small guy then, where I could carry two bags. Uh, and I would carry two bags. Man, one day i never forget it as long as I live. A guy came up and wanted me to caddy for him, and he said he wanted to hit some balls first. I said, okay, sure. So I grabbed his bag, and we walked out, and he had his shag. I had a, a, his shag bag with him. It was built, it was made something like a, 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 a bowling ball bag, and he had probably 100 balls in that thing. And back in, in the early 50s, uh, there, when you went to, to caddy for someone, at least at Prince George's Country Club, there was no range per se. It was just going over to a field they set aside for for that type of activity, for hitting balls. And he would, so the person would dump the balls out and then tell you, well, go out a certain distance. And I would go out and then he'll start hitting balls. And then if you want to go back more, you'll get back and go back a little further. And you would always set the bag down so they have a target. And once they hit it, they very seldom hit it close to the target. So you're running back and forth and, and, and uh, picking up balls. And occasionally I would toss a ball over to the bag. So when he wanted me to go back again, I would just pick it up, put it in the bag, and keep going back. So uh, once he got through hitting balls, he wanted me to caddy for him. And I said, okay. So 
I'm thinking, okay, he's going to put those balls in the trunk of his car. Man, that guy put those balls right in that bag. And here I am lugging that great big bag. And I'm a little guy around the golf course with all those balls in it. I was so upset, man. I, I, if I was a bigger guy at that time, you know, being about 11, 12 years old, I mean, it's a grown man. <laughs> you know, I would, man, that was, that, I, that was the strangest, I guess, thing that ever happened to me as a caddy, you know, and basically I was, I was uh, making money to help support the family. I'm the oldest of eight kids, and uh, they came like stair steps behind me, you know, after the first two, my me and then my, my sister next to me, and then after that was a little break in there, like four years, and then they came one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, like one a year. <laughs> so. Missed a lot of time out of school because of that, because they were both, uh, you know, my mom worked as a, as a uh, day work, uh, at working cleaning people's houses, right. and my father worked in the federal government uh, as a laborer, so they didn't make a whole lot of money, and so that little bit of money I was making as a caddy, like 25, 50 cents a day, I'm sure it helped a lot back in those days. I would keep myself... Uh, about 10 cents because uh, you could get a actually a Coca-Cola and a hot dog and it didn't cost you no more than about 8 cents, you know, back then. So, that, so I'm sure I contributed a lot to the family because I was at that golf course every day. Uh, and on Mondays, we, we could play golf. Uh, the golf course was closed to, to the members and we would go out and play. And there will be six or eight of us out there and playing together. And if you didn't have a golf club, in which I didn't have one, what we did, we would just say, hey, uh, throw me the seven iron or throw me such and such club. And somebody would have it. And they would just, like I said, throw it. They would throw it to you. <laughs> but we learned to play that way. And I got pretty good at it, uh, Lorenzo. I... Uh, got to a point where at that country club, I could play it right around par by the time I was 15 years old, 14, 15. I was shooting par golf on that golf course and beating all the other kids, which was more even the grown-ups, because they had some grown men catting back in those days, too. And so I, I attended a, a high school, 7th through 12th grade. Uh, schools were segregated then. And we didn't have a golf team, but we had a golf, we had a coach that coached football and basketball and everything else track, and he also played golf. So somehow the word got to him that this guy Ted County could play some golf, and so he he came to me one day in the gym and said, "Hey, uh, brother County, I understand you got a golf game." And I said, uh, "Yeah, I play it." So pretty humble at the time, you know, <laughs> and also, also didn't know that somebody had even talked about that to him. And so he said, well, I want to try to get a uh, golf team over here at this school. You know, the white schools got it, and you know, I'd like to get the golf team. And he said, I will go to the Board of Education during the summer and, and see if I can get them to let us have a golf team. He said, but before I... I give you any credit to be as good as they say you are. He said, how about going out and one day bring your clubs in and we go play around golf after school and I'll take you, pick, you know, take you home. And I said, uh, and he said, just one day you bring your clubs, right? I said, what clubs? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any clubs. I, I said, matter of fact, I do have one club. And he said, well, don't worry about that. We'll rent some. And, uh, so sure enough, that day came, and we went out on the golf course. He took me over to Langston. I had didn't know anything about Langston at the time. It was, it was golf course in D.C. Uh, and we played nine holes, and we rented some clubs. Well, he rented some clubs for me. And we went out, and first hole at Langston is a par five. Uh, I hacked it up, but I got a par because it's, it's such a short uh, golf course with that first hole there. 
Uh, as I got older, of course, it was easy to reach in two. But I was able to get a par out of it, but I, I didn't play well. I was nervous. And then on the second hole, a par four, I, I uh, bogey that one. And the next hole, par five, is a little bit tight and difficult. And uh, I, I got a bogey on that one. So he told me on the next tee, he said, uh, he said, uh, Brother County, we're not, we not in school now. So if you, I guess he sensed I was a little nervous playing with the coach. He said, if you uh, miss a shot, miss hit a shot, and you want to let off a little steam, you can curse. He said, <laughs> he said, it's okay. And man, that, that made me relax. I felt so good after that. And I played the rest of the round even par. And, uh, and he all the way home, uh, Coach Freeman, if you knew him, man, he talked plenty of stuff. He was a great he was a great guy, great coach, but he talked plenty of stuff. And he was all the way home. Yes, sir, the boy said you could play in count. Yeah, man. He said, you will be my team captain. He said, man, you got a golf game. You know, all that stuff pumping me up just like he did all sports, you know. But uh, I was proud of what I did. He made me feel good about it. Uh, the next, when school was out, he told me that I would, he would try to talk to the Board of Education and see if they let him have a golf team over at Fairman Heights. But uh, the next season, when we went back to school in September, he called me on the intercom system to come to the gym. And I knew what it was for. And I was hopeful that he would say, yeah, we got a golf team. But the bad news was they wouldn't let me have one. And I was going from the 10th to the 11th grade that year. But he said, you still, you're still in 11th grade this year. He said, I will try again the, the next season. Maybe in your senior year, you could be the team captain for me. Long story short, they never did get a golf team until they had got integration in, in that school. So I graduated. And, and once I graduated from uh, high school, I didn't carry a course anymore. Uh, went to work uh, and didn't actually hit a golf ball anymore till I had settled down, got married, and decided, you know what, I used to be a pretty good golfer. Let me grab, let me go buy some golf clubs. So, <laughs> boy, I will never forget that set either. I put a set of, of uh, J.C. Higgins. J.C. Uh, Higgins from Sears and Roebuck. Later, the kind of name Sears. And, uh, Started playing golf, uh, practiced pretty hard. I, I know there was a field over by my, where I was staying by my house. So I, I would go over on that field a lot of times and hit a little pitch shots and stuff. But started to play about twice a, uh, twice a week, uh, nine holes. And then eventually uh, the game started to come around. And by, by the time I was playing uh, for about a month, I was shooting par golf a better. And uh, there was a golf tournament. There was uh, oftentimes there were a lot of, lots and lots of golf tournaments in the Washington D.C. area. The little, I guess, black circuit, you know. Right. And so I, I was over there one day, and, and people say, "Hey, man, why don't you play in this golf tournament? Uh, it's a it going to be a tournament at a golf course called Cobb's Creek." In, in uh, New Jersey or Pennsylvania, I think it was Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and I had never heard of Cobb Creek, <laughs> and, and by then I'm 25 years old now, and, and just my first season back at playing golf. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I think I'll play in it. So there was a bus leaving D.C. It was a ladies' uh, club called the, I think it was called the Green Ladies. Mm -hmm. They were giving the, the, the trip from the Langston Golf Course to Cobbs Creek up in Pennsylvania. And it was a pro-am, so you got amateurs and pros playing in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I signed up as an amateur. They asked me my handicap. I said, I don't know, but uh, I, I can shoot pretty close to par. And so they said, well, we're going to put you in championship flight. So okay. Played the golf course. It was just a one-day event. I played it. And I shot a 73, uh, won the championship flight. Uh, Lee Elder, who wasn't quite on the tour then, this was in 1963 or 4, 
he uh, he won the pro division. We played from the same tees, and he shot 72. He beat me by a stroke wow. and won the purse. And I got this little, little uh, <laughs> cup. It was a, was a, a silver cup. Good size. It was nice. It was beautiful. Uh, it stayed around the house and, and got it needed to be polished a lot. <laughs> but that's that's. Uh, one of the things that I can always uh, look back to and say, hey, you know, I, I uh, uh, enjoyed my first golf tournament and won in my very first golf tournament, which a lot of people can't say they did that. Uh, played in, played quite a bit of golf around the Washington, D.C. area, and then there was a group of doctors that approached me about because they knew about my game and they approached me about playing turning pro and playing as a professional and this is in the 60s and I got I had a I have a wife and a child by now okay and so I said oh okay he said tell me more about this I you know the first time I knew anything about being a pro right so they said uh uh, I said, tell me about it. What, what's, the, what's the deal with me? How can that benefit me? So uh, the, the guys said, the, these doctors, there was three of them at the time, but it was, I think it was another two, one or two more that wanted me to turn pro. And they said that they would sponsor me in the, turn, in the tournament. I said, okay, uh, what else is involved in me? Do I... Uh, I get a job, I get a chance to quit my job and just play golf, and, and you guys gonna support my family? They said, "Oh no, no, no! We just want to play, pay your green fees, I mean entry fees in tournaments, and we will share the the, the pot, you know, what you your winnings." And I said, "I got a job, <laughs> and I can't afford to pay my own green, fee, my own uh, entry fees in these tournaments, so I." said, no, thank you, and just got up and left him. I said, you know, that's not something, I mean, I was, you know, at least smart enough to know that, first of all, I, I wasn't plan on making a career out of golf then. Right. And then, uh, you're going to pay my entry fee so I can play as a pro, and I don't think it was a whole lot of difference between what I paid to play as an amateur and I said, no, you know, it didn't, didn't make sense to me. Unless you're going to, I knew that if I, if I was going to give up my job, I need to have some money coming in. And they weren't willing to do that, so I wasn't willing to, to uh, sign any papers saying that you guys are right. going to take care of me to, and they pay my entries in golf tournaments. And it was tough back then, wasn't it, Ted, for minorities to give into the professional ranks. Well, you know, you, you know, every day, every week now, golf is on TV, right? The only thing that was on TV back in the early '60s, like that, was uh, was the major golf tournaments. You know, the the, the uh, Masters, the U.S. Open, probably, and I don't know for sure. I didn't didn't watch them then anyway, but I do remember occasionally looking in the uh, through the window of the clubhouse and see saw golf on TV, right. and but there was always the majors. Other than that, there was nothing else televised. Plus, there was no black pros on the tour, right. uh, and I think Lee Elder went out on the tour about four years later, around 68, I think he went out there, and uh, but, but it wasn't as popular in the black community as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, I just played it because I liked it. I was around it as a kid and got good at it. And it was a good way for me to get some exercise because if I remember correctly, I'm trying to remember when the riding carts came around. I, I'm not sure because I always walked. And I, I don't even remember when the riding carts came up to be. But it was a form of exercise. And when you walk and carry that bag and swing that club, right. it's good exercise then. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, after that, uh, I had a I had a pretty good career. Uh, well, there's some other accomplishments. Uh, in in 1970, I, I said, "Well, let me try this public links thing I've been hearing so much about." Okay, so the the 
Washington, D.C. area, which, you know, of course, that was where I was living at the time, and had the, had their qualifying for the public links at a golf course up in Baltimore called Pine Ridge. Again, I'm going to a golf course <laughs> that I have never seen before, never played before, and I'm going to see it for the first time qualifying, okay? So I went up there and got lucky and, and sure enough qualified. I didn't earn it easily though. There was there were only three spots uh, and two guys had tied for first and second ahead of me. So I was tied for third and that was only three spots. So there was a playoff between those two at first and second. They, they, they beat us by one stroke. Uh, and then the third, the third and fourth place were playing for that last spot. And, and we went, and everybody around, you know, if it was, I mean, if you, even if you didn't play golf, it seemed, it was, I didn't realize so many people were so interested in watching the playoff. Wow. So everybody around, man, came to follow us around that golf course, and, and the, the two guys tied for first place, uh, one won it on the first hole. So it was over for them. But nobody went back. We, we were right behind them teeing off. And we played three extra holes. I won it on the third extra hole. Uh, so got to go to Pappy Go Park in, in Phoenix, Arizona to represent the Washington, D.C. area in the national finals. Uh, did not uh, make the cut. But I did shoot the best score of the Washington, D.C. guys. Cut off for that was at 150, and I shot 77 my first day, first round rather, and which was the first day. And I said, "Well," and they had projected the property cut would be at 150. And I said, "Heck, that's going to be a piece of cake because I really felt like I should. I played so bad that with that 77, it was like I hacked the golf course up. But it was a 77, and." I met uh, Bill Dickey, who lived in Phoenix. I met Bill Dickey that year. He came over and, and, and he gathered all the black guys up and we went out to party with him over his house and uh, swimming and stuff. And the next day I had a late tea time. I said, hey, I know I'm going to make this feel, you know. At 150, I shot 77. I know I can shoot 73 or better on this golf course. I shot 78 the next day, <laughs> but like I said, I was still I still had the best score amongst the guys from D.C. Uh, and other than that, after that, uh, I was also in a golf club called the Oxen Blades. We had probably the biggest golf tournament in the Washington D.C. area every year. The largest purse, pro purse, and Talking about black tournament now, and also, uh, so we, was, we had pro am every year, and, and you know, first prize was pretty good size for for a tournament of that nature. Uh, the biggest, nothing was bigger than that uh, anywhere around. On, you know, when you went to Jersey to play in Bill Bishop's or down in Durham or wherever you went, you know, Teddy Rose tournament, well, that was still the biggest purse. We had the biggest purse, and so in that tournament, I won a few times. I won when I and then when I turned pro, I didn't turn pro to 1990. I was already 50 years old, okay. And when I turned pro, uh, I played in some tournaments. I tried qualifying for the U.S. Open. I missed it, but twice. I tried. I tried it twice. Missed the. Uh, being in the, in the playoff by one stroke each time. And I can think back, man, wow, all those strokes I wasted, you know, out on that golf course. And, you know, Lorenzo, I'm, I don't get nervous in golf. I never did. I never felt what I did as a kid. But as an adult, I don't, I don't feel the pressure. Uh, it's, it's just something that I know I can do. There's nothing, nothing new playing golf. 
It's, it's a game that I played before. I played it for a long, long time. So what do you see being nervous about it? You know, it's, it's nothing it's nothing to be nervous about. You're going to you can do one or two things in this game. You can win or lose. You can hit the ball or miss hit the ball. That's it. That's it. So, and, and tomorrow you're going to wake up. Your family's still there. Your friends are still there. So, hey, man, that's the attitude I teach. When I teach the game, I try to tell the people to relax. There's nothing to, nothing. It's a game that you're supposed to enjoy. So, I want you to play it until you're not able to walk anymore and enjoy it. So, be good. I want you to be good now. I, don't, I mean, I'm going to get you. There has never been a person that I didn't dedicate my whole ability to making them as good as I can make them. And I'm still doing that today. I'm teaching right here in this facility right here, East Potomac Golf Course in Washington, D.C. And I'm still as passionate about it now as I was when I first started. Well, Ted, that's a great cut in right now. You've told us a lot about growing up in golf and caddying and, and getting uh, family started and looking at the professional ranks. And we're going to take a quick break here and then go back into the people you've taught, uh, the, the, the people you've touched. I know you've done a lot with you, and we'll talk about that after this break. Yeah, we're back here with Ted County at uh, May 24th, 2014. We're here at East Potomac Golf Club in the Washington, D.C. area. And Ted, we had stopped off by talking a, a little bit about uh, your contributions in golf, and, and you said you was going to give us a little couple of little stories there. But but let the people know, you know, in general, you know, some of the things you've done with the youth, and then some of the stories you have in golf. Because I've seen a lot of people you've touched in golf, and, and in your teaching, uh, I've seen a lot of people improve and, and talk about your name as as a, a label of who, who gave them some uh, some good uh, fundamentals. Sure. Uh... Lorenzo, when I uh, decided that I'm going to come out of government and, and turn pro, go to work as a pro, at a pro shop, a golf course, I thought that, boy, this is the opportunity to get my game together, ready for the tour, senior tour, because I was 50, like I said. And I went, to, I went to work at Andrews Air Force Base Golf Course, and that's where I met you. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you, buddy. I was a little naive because I thought, man, I'm going to get to play golf every day. <laughs> <laughs> but once you get started in the golf business, at least in my case, I went to work at Andrews and you have to work 40 hours a week, number one, to earn your PGA membership. You got to work 40 hours a week. So I put in my 40 in the pro shop. But there was such a demand for teaching at, at Andrews. And, and the other thing is, for me as a teacher at least, because they knew I could play. Yeah. See, Tex Guillory, I know you know Tex, yeah, remember Tex. Tex is gone now and, and bless his soul. Yeah. But Tex, say, Ted say, I want you to play at, in, at the member guest at Andrews. And that was in 1989. Uh, the year before I turned pro. And I said, okay, uh, what I got to do? He said, just pay the entry fee, you know, <laughs> be my partner, let's go ahead out there. He said, Ted, no blacks have ever won this tournament. Mm -hmm. He said, I think we're going to, we stand a good chance. I said, okay. So, Tex knew I was hitting the ball good, and Tex was also hitting the ball good at that time. So, we, uh, when the, when the tournament came around, you playing, we playing two rounds of golf, playing the East Course, the only two they had at that time, the East Course and the West Course, play the West first. So we played the West Course and we shot 65, and, and the way this format uh, was is that both of us would play our own ball all the way, 
and you write the lowest score that you get between the two balls on, on your scorecard. Well, I was pretty hot that day as far as playing. I shot 65, and, and it was easy for me to remember that I shot the 65 because I had one bogey. And Tex bogey that same hole. And Tex didn't didn't contribute not one birdie that day. <laughs> and that's unusual, but he didn't have a birdie. So and so I always teased him, I say, Hey man, when I carried you, you know, I shot sixty five and you you know, you didn't help me. Yes you did. You helped me on one hole, didn't you? We both bogey that hole. <laughs> that's a good one. So but anyway, the the next day Believe me, he played his part because we shot 65 again on the East Coast, and I was don't remember exactly how many birdies Tex had then, but he had more than I did, and we birdied some of the same holes as well. But we wound up uh, shooting 65, 65, and one. Uh, the the member guests at Andrews Air Force Base, Tex made sure it got in the base paper. Tex, Tex took pictures, Tex did everything, and he let everybody know that they, we're the first blacks to ever win that tournament. I'm not sure, I mean, I don't know, it's probably something that won since then, but we, we took home the, the, the top prize. Wow, and what a buddy, man, what a guy, man, Tex Gilbert. Yeah. But anyway, I thought that going to work at a golf course, man, hey, a big opportunity to play golf every day. That was a problem. Because they knew I could play, my lesson book stayed full. That I was in such demand for teaching that I had to keep adding hours. So as it turned out, all my off-duty time from, from inside the pro shop was teaching. So neglecting my game, looking at a bunch of bad swings, looking at beginners, and so, although it didn't take from me, take away from me having to do what I had to do, you know, as a PGA uh, pro, uh, club pro, you have to pass your PAT. So, you have to work, and then you had to work in the program for six months before you could even sign up to, to uh, uh, become a, a PGA uh, apprentice, and you had to pass your PAT. So I worked six months. I started like in July or something in that time frame. So it was the next year when I signed to, to do my PAT and signed up to be a, 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 an apprentice and professional. So I uh, did my PAT. I was the medalist when I did my PAT. I shot 72, 68. I think it was the other way around. I shot 68 first and then 72. Uh, that was back in 1991, uh, and I was a medalist by five shots that day. The closest person to me was at 145, and the target score to qualify or to, to earn your, P, uh, your, your uh, PAT, you had to shoot uh, 150. You know, I shot 140, so that was a piece of cake for me because <laughs> my game was still there at that time I mean I could really still play well but over the years of teaching and teaching and teaching uh, and remember I had mentioned earlier about trying to qualify for the US Open uh, senior US Open and missed it by a stroke each time uh, at that point with the demand for teaching I decided that you know what uh, it's no use me trying to get on the tour. I gave up on that idea at age 52. I said, I'm going to be the best teacher I could be. So, I had mentioned earlier how I will work with you to get you to be as good as you can be. And I really feel that I have touched a lot of lives, have made a lot of people happy, and the you know, choir's kept, I think I'm a pretty good teacher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I really think I'm a pretty good teacher. Uh, I got involved with the first T program, at first at Langston Golf Course in D.C., and then uh, at, at the uh, 
Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Henson Creek Golf Course. Uh, I left the DC program because right after 9-11, uh, 2000, 2001, uh, when the 9-11 took place, I couldn't get my students on base anymore. I had, I had probably touched lives of more than 2,000 students or clients at that time. I've had that many uh, generals and everybody else I've been teaching over at, at Andrews. But I also ran quite a few people or taught quite a few people through the Ebenezer uh, Church uh, Golf Ministry. Uh, and so I had so many people that I could not get on base anymore and they, cause they closed the base. If you were if you were not active duty, you couldn't get on base. Uh, you, we had we had people who were members at Andrews Air Force Base Golf Course couldn't get on base. We had people retired military couldn't get on base. You, we had people who uh, had appointments at the at the hospital there couldn't get on base. Prescriptions filled at that hospital couldn't get on base. So. So to make a long story short, I decided, you know what? And this is going, this is like after about a month. I said, I think I, I need to still make some money because I was teaching only at that time. I said, I'm going to uh, go down the street from where I live. There was a golf range down there called Golf Zillow Driving Range. And I can get my people to come down there to teach them. And I sure enough, I did. They all followed me wherever I went. Uh, but at Godzilla, they had the uh, first tea program getting started, and they were looking for somebody to teach it. Uh, and they so they heard of me being down there, and they figured, okay, Godzilla is the closest uh, a, a range to Henson Creek Golf Course, who did not have a range at that time. They do now. So, the, so the first tea kids with, that was going to come out of that facility wanted to be taught down at, at uh, uh, Goff's Little Driving Range and, and they seek me out to teach it and so I, I had that program and when I moved out of the Maryland area, moved to Florida in 2004, that program at the time I got started with it was something like maybe 20 kids and when I left to go to Florida and this was I think I started that program teaching it around 2001. Well, yeah, 2001. Uh, when I moved to Florida, I had over 125 kids in the program, and a lot of, and I won't say a lot of them, but one kid won the all county championship that I worked with until I left to go to, to uh, uh, Florida. There was two sisters that went on to college on a golf scholarship. There was uh, several guys uh, went on to college and played on, on a golf scholarship. And I think I had a small role in, in contributing something to that uh, because I had, I had them with me for about three, three years or more. And they were, I had some of them that came in the program at the time, somewhere on like six, seven, eight years old and so. So on, so, uh, so I helped him quite a bit, I think. Uh, when I moved to Florida, I, I went to work uh, at the LPGA International and uh, learned quite a bit more because I, I worked uh, close to a uh, top 100 teacher named Craig Shanklin, white teacher, uh, that I, I had the opportunity to meet and work beside. And so I, I just feel like over the years, I dedicated myself to teaching and to be the best teacher I could be and gave up on the idea of trying to get on that tour right. uh, after a few years of, of, uh, of working in the field to, uh, uh, to become a, and I went on to earn my card to be a PJ Pro and I still have my class A. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, and right now, like I said, I, I've been uh, eight weeks now from uh, up here teaching at uh, the East Potomac Golf Course as an old man. I'm still teaching. Hey, you're still doing and, it. And still helping people to smile 
and make progress and and I enjoy it. I, I want to just keep on teaching as long as I can walk. I think one of the things that God put me on this earth for is to teach. So here I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ted, that's great. Um, in closing, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. What do you think was the most uh, frustrating part of golf for you, and you know what what you think was the most rewarding for you? And then I, I want to leave it with, uh, what do you think it takes to be a great golf? Okay. Uh, most frustrating thing for me was, I guess, uh, over the years uh, teaching the game. Uh, I, I didn't get the opportunity to, to uh, well, you know, I was going to say I didn't get the opportunity to play the tour, but I think, I think, I guess, really, I guess, it's hard for a black person to get a job, a pro job, at, you know, a good country club, a good golf course. The, they'll bring you on as a, as a, uh, teacher or as a assistant professional buddy but let me tell you it's hard to get a job as a as a head professional in this business well when you think about this business for example let me give you a good example uh when i did my business school one when when i they changed the program since i got my card but it was business school one, business school, PAT, business school one, business school two, mm -hmm. what you went through. And then you had to write an essay almost to, and, and do your membership interview. Uh, well, uh, business school one, when I went there, I was in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm sorry, no, no, that was business school two. Business school one was in, uh, in uh, Callaway Garden, Georgia. I got my books uh, in like in November when it started getting real, real cold. Uh, what, so I had time to study the, uh, the books. It was something like about ten books that you had to to read from cover to cover and, and remember as much as you could because you're going to take a test at the end. And you go away for a week. And I went to Callaway Garden, and when I I got there, I. Business School 1 and Business School 2 was taking place there at the same time. It was one other black person in Business School 1 with me. Out of probably about 3,000 PGA system pros, uh, apprentices, because we were apprentices then trying to get to be a Class A. Out of 3,000, you had two wow. blacks. This is in, in not far from Atlanta, Georgia, right? In the business school, too, I, ha I happened to stick my head in the door a few times. There was uh, one brother in there that I saw out of another 3,000 or more, okay? So you can say that, and probably still today, that, that you're going to have an awful lot more, as you well know, white pros than, you, than black pros. Black pros are not... Too plentiful, right? right? Uh, and same thing on tour, if you think about it. Right. Uh, and then when I went away to business school, too, in Lexington, yeah, I'll get back to it, and when I went there,